Welcome back to the channel. My name is Anton Vjeltsin and I'm a criminal defense attorney here in the Southern District of California. I represent many individuals with criminal histories. And often enough, we have individuals who are even career offenders. In those circumstances, these people are often Fourth Amendment waivers. In this video, I'm going to explain what it means to waive your Fourth Amendment rights, but I will also encourage you and your attorneys to continue the fight and make sure to bring up suppression issues even if you're the Fourth Amendment waiver. I will talk about a Ninth Circuit case today which is very fact-intensive. That's why I have a whiteboard behind me to help you understand the facts and that there's hope at the end of the day. The case we're going to discuss today is United States versus Granbury, which is a Ninth Circuit case about people who are on probation or parole and their Fourth Amendment rights. Remember the Fourth Amendment? It's the one that says that you have a right against unreasonable searches and seizures. What does that mean? It means that officers need to have a warrant before they can search you, your house, and so on. But if you're on probation or parole, chances are you have signed what's called a Fourth Amendment waiver, meaning that you gave up your Fourth Amendment rights. But before you give up completely, I need you to understand that there's hope at the end of the day and that you can argue the suppression issues even if you are a Fourth Amendment waiver. Often enough, my clients call it Fourth Waiver. Mr. Granbury is on parole. So you have to carefully read the conditions of his parole. So let's discuss that with this board that's going to help me out. The parole condition that Mr. Granbury signed stated, you and your residence and any property under your control may be searched without a warrant by an agent of the Department of Corrections because after all, he's on parole, so the Department of Corrections would be his probation parole officer, but it also says that, or any law enforcement officer. So it's a very broad provision. At first, when you read it, it seems like he has no Fourth Amendment rights at all. So let's talk about the case. The officers receive an anonymous tip that a garage outside and in the back side of the 31st Street, and the tipster referred to it as Looney Spot, somebody was selling crack cocaine. The officers knew that Looney is also AKA for Mr. Granbury, who was on parole. Chances are they knew that information from the previous case, because after all, Mr. Granbury is on parole, meaning that he's a felon. They observed a red Pontiac which was parked outside of this address. This court has been called in session to pass judgment on a special new car from Pontiac. All rise for the judge. Judge, the special great one from Pontiac GTO. Her speed shifter, three speeder four. Pontiac Ram Air 366 horse. And they also knew that this Pontiac was registered to Mr. Granbury. On January 14th, they noticed that Mr. Granbury sold a substance to a woman. They saw a transaction. They saw Mr. Granbury give a bag to this woman, and the woman gave back what looked like money to Mr. Granbury. But instead of arresting both of them on the spot, the officers decided to continue their surveillance. This is often a tactic in the cases that I handle. Instead of arresting my client right away, the officers continue surveilling just to build a bigger case against my client. In this case, they noticed that Mr. Granbury went to an apartment that was two blocks away at 3418 South Arlington Avenue. And they began their surveillance. They did it from January 14th 
to the 25th, and they saw Mr. Granbury there about 10 times. And they were also surveilling him for about 9, 10 days. They noticed that six of the times, at least, Mr. Granbury used a key to enter the apartment. And then they observed Mr. Granbury inside the apartment through the window. They never saw Mr. Granbury inside the apartment after 10 p.m. And they also never saw Mr. Granbury at the apartment before about 9 a.m. So he was never there overnight. Cops didn't check the names on the mailboxes. They also never saw Mr. Granbury carry groceries, laundry, trash or mail inside or outside of the apartment. They didn't investigate who lived at this apartment, whether Mr. Granbury actually lived there. And they also saw another transaction. They saw a man come up to the apartment, walk inside, walk out. They stopped the man, searched him, and he had about $9,000 in cash on him, which was somewhat suspicious. When I said that they never investigated whether Mr. Arlington, uh, Mr. Granbury actually lived at Arlington Avenue, the reason why I mentioned that is because the cops actually knew where Mr. Granbury lived. He lived at 10652 South Manhattan Place. How do they know this? They knew that because that's the address he reported to the parole officer. It is also the address that was on his driver's license and registered with the DMV. In order to check where Mr. Granbury lived, the officers also surveilled this spot. But instead of doing all of the surveillance like they did here for so many days, instead they went to Manhattan Place for only one hour. What did they see there? Well, nothing. They didn't see Mr. Granbury at this apartment. So they just assumed he didn't live there. But the apartment did look occupied. They never interviewed anyone inside this address. And they also never contacted his parole officer to check whether the parole officer made his own checks on the house and whether Mr. Granbury actually lived there. Why did the cops didn't do that? Well, because they said they didn't want to tip off Mr. Granbury that they're doing this extra surveillance. On January 25th, they finally decide to arrest Mr. Granbury. They arrest him near the apartment at 3418 Arlington Avenue. Mr. Granbury just left the apartment and started to drive off on his Pontiac. When the officers turned the lights on, Mr. Granbury fled. Case of happy feet. Happy feet. I've got those happy feet. I give them a low down beat and they begin dancing. He fled but eventually got stopped he was also running away at some point by foot. When he was finally stopped, the officer told him, Mr. Granbury, you're on parole. To acknowledge the fact that he's a felon and that they can now search him. They didn't ask where Mr. Granbury lived or if anyone else lived at this apartment at Arlington Avenue. Instead, the officer simply told Mr. Granbury that we're going to search your place. And the response was, do what you got to do. So what do the cops do? Well, they do exactly what Mr. Granbury said. They decided to search this apartment at Arlington Avenue. What do they find there? They find cocaine and a gun. So Mr. Granbury gets charged with felon in possession and drug charges. How do they search this apartment? Well, the officers did not have a warrant, so they completely relied on this parole condition because they believed that this was Mr. Granbury's residence. So let's take a look at that. This is a Ninth Circuit case where the government makes a number of arguments. First, they make arguments one through four. They say that this fits Mr. Granbury's 
residents this apartment at Arlington Avenue because number one, when the officers said that they were going to search, quote unquote, his place, Mr. Gramery responded, do what you got to do, meaning that he acknowledged that this is, quote unquote, his place. The second argument is that when the officers went to Manhattan Place, they didn't see Mr. Granbury at that location. So they were convinced Mr. Granbury did not live at Manhattan Place. Next, the officers knew from surveillance that Mr. Granbury has been seen at this apartment at 3418. And another important factor that the government says is that they saw Mr. Granbury use a key to enter the apartment at least six times. But the Ninth Circuit doesn't buy the argument. Number one, the court says that the officers failed to surveil the Manhattan place. Because they only did it for an hour, of course they wouldn't see Mr. Granbury at this location. They needed to surveil Manhattan place just as much as they did the apartment at Arlington uh, Avenue. One thing that you might want to check out is another Ninth Circuit case, Howard, which distinguishes between staying somewhere, visiting somewhere, versus residence. When you live somewhere, that's different. And Howard says that even if you stay somewhere overnight, like your friend's house, that doesn't mean that you reside there. What you need to look at is quote unquote home base. Whether you do things like taking the trash out of the house, picking up mail and so on. The key the court acknowledges is important. The fact that Mr. Granbury used the key to enter the apartment a number of times. But they say it becomes not as important when we know that he doesn't stay at Arlington Avenue overnight. Based on those factors, the Ninth Circuit says that's not enough to use the parole condition, specifically the residence part, in order to search the apartment without a warrant. So the government makes another attempt that the second provision in the condition that says any property under Mr. Granbury's control can be searched. Well, the Ninth Circuit doesn't buy it. They say that there's no cases in the Ninth Circuit or really any other circuits where any property was used in order to justify looking at somebody's apartment or a place of residence or where somebody lived. It just didn't make any sense. Usually when we're talking about property, when we have the word residence, is that this is probably physical property, right? Backpacks, uh, vehicles, and so on. And then if we did say that any property can include apartments or houses, that would really go against interpretive canon, which is something we have to use as attorneys and, and uh, judges to interpret statutes. What does that mean? It means that no words in the provision can be inoperative, void, or insignificant based on other words. What does that mean? It means that if we say that property, any property, includes the word residence, why do we need the word residence? That would not make any sense. Nobody would ever write a statute this way if the second provision takes over the first. So those are, in fact, distinct. Because both arguments fail for the government, the court says that the evidence found inside the apartment, meaning cocaine and the gun, has to be suppressed. Because after all, this parole provision does not help the officers in searching this apartment because it is not Mr. Granbury's residence. So when we first started the video, it seemed like this provision was very broad and it would include the apartment at 3418 Arlington Avenue. But by the end of reading this case, United States versus Granbury, we learn that Mr. Granbury was actually successful in suppressing the gun and cocaine as fruits of the poisonous tree. 
Because the search was illegal, the government cannot use the drugs and the gun that was found at Arlington Avenue against Mr. Granbury. I hope this video helped you understand how the Fourth Amendment and being on parole or probation works. And if you enjoyed this video, please click like, subscribe, hit that bell notification button so next time I post, you'll be first to know. And if you have a case in the Southern District of California, give me a call because I can help.